Forced Research, if you don't know who we are, uh, we're what you would call an industry analyst firm. So you've got the financial analysts that are up on the street that they go and they look at a company and they look at their income statement and uh, uh, you know all the other uh, information that, that the company provides and they make a judgment about whether or not they're a good buy or not. Uh, what we do is we take a look at the technologies that companies are investing in, mainly software and hardware technologies, and we advise our clients on which technologies we think are the right investments uh, for them to be making. Now, for me in particular, I write to application development and delivery professionals, so that means I tend to concentrate on software development technologies and the platform technologies that developers use when companies are writing custom software uh, to drive their business, and that's the perspective that I tend to look at. Um, at Forrester, we think that uh, one of the reasons that there is such disruptive change going on in the industry right now, and one of the reasons that you're lucky because there's a tremendous amount of opportunity out there that that disruption is causing, is because we're in the transition phase uh, between two major uh, industrial business models. Uh, we've seen this happen before. Uh, from 1900 to 1960, we were in what we would call the age of manufacturing. Uh, from 1960 to 1990, we were in the age of distribution. Then we moved into the age of information, and we are now moving to what we think is the age of the customer. Uh, let me start by explaining each of these a little bit. Um, in the age of manufacturing, we had companies like Ford as the, uh, as the archetype of a successful company. How did they make money? Um, can sum it up with a quote from Henry Ford. Any customer can have a car painted any color that he wants so long as it is black, okay? What's behind that? The ability to manufacture something, manufacture as much of it as possible, as fast as possible, and sell it for as cheaply as you possibly can, and then you profit on the unit costs uh, that you get uh, from that particular model. From there, we move to the age of distribution. Probably the best example of, uh, uh, of a company that prospered in that era was Sears, although you could say Walmart, maybe Target, uh, would uh, also be really, really good e examples here. And the way that I would sum up this phase would be any customer can buy anything they want as long as we stock it in our local store or you can order it from our catalog. So, you know, again, the efficiencies and the profits were made by squeezing out the profits in the distribution chain. You know, Walmart uh, has become a master of this uh, by sourcing distribution worldwide uh, from low-cost centers. Um, age of information. Uh, with coming to the web, uh, we were able to do all kinds of things that didn't necessarily involve physical distribution channels, having to go to the store or having to get a catalog mailed to us in the, uh, in the U.S. mail. The way that I might summarize this stage, any customer can have anything that they want as long as they are at home or at work, connected to the internet, trust an e-commerce platform, and can wait for us to ship it to them. Okay? Still an improvement if you don't like to go out and shop in a physical store or you don't have a store that's, that's local uh, uh, to you. So, in the age of the customer, um, we build on that age of information. But what's happening here is something that is very different for the tr from the traditional uh, leaders in each of those three phases. Because throughout all those phases, there was a real high control um, if you look at the forces that were guiding uh, the business model. What we are seeing in the age of the customer is a subtle shift in power from the suppliers to the buyers and to some of the other forces uh, that, are at, uh, that are in play as we look at how businesses uh, create successful, profitable business models. Anybody know what this is? Say, paper airline ticket. Anyone used one of these? There, I'm sure there are a few folks. Now, the, in, the, the interesting thing about a paper airline ticket is this is the equivalent of a negotiable instrument from the airline's perspective. If you lose a paper ticket, you're out of luck. You have to go buy a new ticket. If it's an, if it's an electronic ticket and you've got the paper thing, you can still get that reprinted. Um, so in the age of paper tickets, uh, 
the, the processes for airlines were fairly uh, inefficient, but because of the difficulty and the cost of handling paper tickets, uh, there was a high barrier to entry in terms of providing a service. Now, as we look at what's happened over the past uh, 15 years for airline tickets, the paper ticket is pretty much dead now unless you're in certain parts of the world. Even the paper electronic ticket is dead. I remember I used to have to submit the stubs of the tickets on my expense report or else I wouldn't get reimbursed. Finally, thankfully, I don't have to do that anymore because they trust that if I bill the flight that I actually took the flight. Uh, but we see that about two-thirds of all tickets sold now are actually purchased online, managed online, electronic tickets. At the same time, What's happened is because it's gotten easier to process the information, it's gotten easier to, to, to access the information, to manage the information, uh, carriers have tended to get a little bit more aggressive with their ticket prices because their costs have gone down, and uh, the average yield per mile that an airline is getting uh, is lower than it has ever been. Let's look at another example. Anybody know what this is? Anybody got one of those? I still have a bunch in my basement. I really need to go throw them out at some point because I haven't listened to a cassette probably in, I don't know, maybe 10 years now. Same sort of thing. You know, we had very, you know, uh, uh, analog type media. Uh, you know, music was something that, uh, uh, that, uh, that, that, that we dealt with uh, in, in, in lots of different mediums. But we've now gone to a world where music spending online has gone from 5% of the average household's budget here in the U.S. to 74% over the last 50 years. So the cassette or the 8-track tape is, is dead. I hear vinyl's making a comeback as an uh, uh, enthusiast format, but I'm not sure whether it's ever going to be the kind of market uh, that it ever was. Uh, at the same time, if we look at the spend per American household on music, it's gone from $127 a household down to 43 over the last 15 years. So in industry after industry, we tend to see this trend, whereas more and more base services are migrating to an electronic format, to a digital format, to an online uh, capability. At the same time, the revenue yields that companies are getting from those services are getting increasingly compressed. In the age of the customer, these companies have to be able to ma uh, master the capability to build and deliver software on a regular basis. What does that mean? That means they need to devote attention to their customer experience. They need to think like software companies, not just the folks in the Valley and at the 128 corridor and in New York and Austin, uh, all of them, even if they're in Peoria or Omaha. They need to be able to master rapid iterative development. That tends to be the hardest point for the large companies that I speak with on a daily basis. When I tell them you have to organize your development shop around the capability to deliver eight to 12 releases a year, they look like their heads are about to blow off because that's just not how they're organized. And that's a lot harder problem to solve than, oh, here's the technology that you need to buy and you can get it from IBM or you can get it from Oracle or you can get it from Amazon. If I'm getting fitness data off my Fitbit Surge and my phone knows that I'm running at about six or seven miles an hour, why do I have to manually start a run? Why shouldn't it just assume that you're running, so I'm going to start recording running data, and when you stop at the street, maybe I'll pause and then I'll keep going. So that ability to master context uh, of all the information that we're going to get from all the sensors and all the devices that we have is going to be beyond the capability of 95% of the businesses out there uh, that you will probably end up working at. And yet it is going to be most, one of the most important things that is going to separate the winners in the age of the customer from the losers, the ability to harness the customer's context and use it appropriately. Your success is going to depend on matching the speed at which customers are adopting these new technologies. If you can't keep up, even if you get something out and you hit the market right from a timing perspective, you're not going to be able to sustain it. A lot of our clients are banks and they all have their own mobile applications and they introduced their mobile apps and they did nothing for 18 months because that's just the software development cycle that they were on. And about six months in, they started noticing that their three-star ratings started turning into two-star ratings, and then were going to one-star ratings. And they couldn't fathom this. And it was because 
the peer, their peers in the market that actually got what was going on and understand the principles of hyper-adoption had grokked the fact that they needed to invest in continuous delivery and release on a regular basis and put new features out to keep the customers engaged. You're going to have to make sure that you make that case as well. To do that, you're going to have to transform the culture at the companies that you work for. And that's really the hardest task that I'm going to give you. You're going to need to convince the companies that you work at to be agile. Uh, as I mentioned, you're going to have to convince them to give up control. Now, the theory behind this is that as we're in a disruptive period, we are building a lot of complex systems that we're not sure exactly the right way to solve the problems. When you are in that world, this is something called the Kinefin uh, framework. If you're not familiar with it, I highly encourage you to, uh, to study it. Uh, but when you're in a complex problem environment, you need to institute a, uh, a methodology where you probe the problem, you sense the response to your probe, and then you respond. That's the fast feedback cycle. That's what you see in the Eric Ries lean startup uh, type of thinking, the capability to work in that area. We're in a new age, the age of the customer. Software is rebalancing the power to the customer. It's eroding barriers to entry. It's increasing the ability to substitute technology into existing markets. The way that we build apps and services from a technology perspective is changing. From a process perspective, it's changing. It's getting cheaper. It's getting faster. That creates opportunities. There's a huge skill gap out there. If you can master the connection between business and technology and understand these changes, you are going to do fine. You're not going to have a problem getting a job. You're going to make a lot of money. Um, when by reducing the adoption risk that consumers, that customers have by investing in great customer experience. That's why I have an Apple machine. I might not like the company, might not like the technology, but it's a great customer experience and the stuff just works. And then finally, don't just solve the technology problem make sure that you also challenge the culture of the organizations that you work at because that's the real issue. You do all that, you'll be great. Thanks a lot.